Hello and welcome to Spotlight Sportcast with myself, Munira Ramatilla, where the world of sport meets the power of storytelling. My guest for today is Jess Stemmett, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Alliance Football, amongst other things. Um, you know, ex-coach uh, in her home country and so much more. But I'll leave her to introduce herself and just tell everybody a little bit more about herself. Thank yes. you ever so much for having me, Munira. Um, yes, I'm Jess Simner, uh, COO at Alliance Football Club. Um, my background is with the English FA, so I joined Alliance two years ago. I relocated to Dubai in 2022 from um, a role of talent technical coach with the English Football Association. Wow. Okay. And how was that? Um, yeah, fantastic. Like I, when I look back, I, I built from a very young age to yeah. get to that point, point. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a role that I aspired to take from maybe my early 20s. Um, So, yeah, it was just something that I had female role models in those Mm -hmm. positions and I looked and I thought, that's where I want to be. Um, But in terms of the remit, I was assistant coach to national teams Mm -hmm. and then I acted as the link between uh, the players when they're with the national team Mm -hmm. and then when they're in their own environment in the club. Wow. Did you play football? Uh, A very long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I started very young, yeah. but then I also finished very young and got into coaching very early. Okay, so, that's good though, especially yeah, for women. That's very good. Yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I am today if that hadn't have happened. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to keep a hand in the game. I think mm-hmm. I finished maybe like between 13 and 15 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time I was at Derby County. Um, but then I very early, I think 15, I started coaching. 15? Yeah. Okay, what age group were you coaching at 15? Like maybe like nine 10 year olds. I was volunteering. So I, yeah. I was told very young that um, I had some ill health. Mm-hmm. So I was told if I wanted oh. to get better, then mm-hmm. I need to stop playing football. And as you can imagine, as a young, maybe 13, 14 year old, that was devastating. That devastating. It was my life. Yeah, yeah. Football was my life. So my only way to keep a hand in football and be around my social circle and everything that I knew was to just be there, help out, pick up the cones. Um, give words of wisdom as a young, yeah. probably young role model to the eight, nine, ten year olds. How was that for you? I mean, you were what, 13 or so, mm. and you get this news that, look, the thing that you love the most is not going to happen for you. Mm. How how was that for you? Yeah, when I look back, it's, it's probably a trauma in my yeah. life. I almost had to grieve. Yes. Everything that I knew um, yeah. and leave a life behind that I thought was was everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think all my friends played football. Yeah. It was four or five times a week. I would go to school. I'd play at school, yeah. play in the lunch break. So I'd yes. come home, drop my bag, go out and play football. So it was a huge part of who I was, my identity in a way. Yes. So it was almost a bit of a, whoa, what do I do now? Mm. Um, but I... There was a moment, I think I was around 10 years old. And when I look back, I think, wow, it's amazing, really. I can picture it now because mm-hmm. we were a team photo shoot at Pride Park Stadium. I was 10 <laughs> and it was absolutely freezing. Yeah. There's a picture of me and I'm like shaking in a full kit, Derby County kit. And I remember they um, they interviewed us as kids, like, what's your hobbies? What position do you play? What's your favorite club? And the last question was, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my whole team, I think it was maybe 15 or 16 of us, said that they wanted to play for England. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I have no clue why, but I said very adamantly I wanted to coach for England. Wow. And at 10, I was still playing. Yes. So I'm not sure what made me have that set in my mind, but that's that was my response. So then, then it sort of transitioned from when I couldn't play any longer. Mm-hmm into coaching it was almost natural amazing that's all i know (laughs) (laughs) no but it's amazing that at at such a young age and i think a lot of the times we hold back or we think that 10 year old me wanted this but i don't think that year old me wants this Mm. but deep down inside something was there something was there yeah Mm. and And i was very fortunate to mm. then be around some very good people who gave me opportunities, young and experienced. Yes. Um, I volunteered from 15 to probably 18, 19. Until then I was offered my first paid coaching role. Um, and then that's it. It just stemmed from there. Yeah. 
I think it's 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 also especially in sport. I mean, I know in other careers as well, but especially in sport and having to try and navigate through so much, having strong mentors around you, mm-hmm. it's really really important. Yeah, yeah. And I have. Um, it was a chairman of the club at the time. Mm-hmm. His name's Raf Long, and even now I feel like I have a lot. I owe him a lot yeah. because he gave me this platform mm-hmm. to begin my coaching journey, mm. and then that almost shaped the direction of travel for the rest of my life. How was talent identification for, I mean, it's the lioness, it's, you know, the current European champions, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> how was that? Look, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, within Europe and within England, there's a lot more that has been done for development. Mm-hmm. But how was that like 15 years ago uh, to when you then came into the national structures? Yeah, sure. Um I remember when I was still playing, mm-hmm. we had like a center of excellence program. Yeah. So you'd play with your club and then you would access this once a week. As a kid, I had no clue what it was. I just went to this session that I knew that I was selected to go to. Yeah. There's additional training. We had this little log book and we log our like performance and development targets and reflections. Um, I wasn't really aware of what it was I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember it being just, this once a week so it wasn't it was it was consistent regular but it wasn't what it looks like now yeah so um fast forward now players will be in structured academies they train probably four or five times a week yeah have access to multidisciplinary support so they will have physical performance coaches uh, educational well-being officers they have access to everything and when i look back there was not much there it's mm-hmm. obviously grown a lot yes um and in terms of talent id um we when i w- was originally with uh, the the fa in in the role we very much only looked within the center of excellences or the regional talent clubs yeah what they came to be called yeah and we realized very quickly that you're almost blocking out a whole cohort of players that yeah. maybe playing in the cages in inner city Manchester or um, playing on a grass field somewhere in rural Devon. And so we changed the direction of uh, like where we, where we shone a light and where we went looking. Um, We, there was something called the discover my talent program. And I think actually it's still going Okay. in that um, we went widespread. We looked at how we engage with schools, Mm -hmm. how we connect with, um, parents, grassroots coaches, county FAs, so that anyone and everyone anywhere could nominate a player Mm -hmm. that they think had and displayed talent and Mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we, from scratch, created these future Lioness characteristics that we were looking for. Okay. And it was, it didn't really matter where the player was playing, how much they'd played. If they displayed some of these and they had standout attributes, then we would look at them. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. And that's still going on now? Yeah. Yeah, it's changed, the, the strategic direction has changed mm-hmm. massively in the last few years. But that's amazing, you know, um, and I think it also gives a player hope. Mm-hmm. You know, look, we know sport's very cutthroat. I mean, 2% to make it professional mm-hmm. if they're lucky. But just having that kind of structure really helps in a player themselves feeling that, okay, I can do more and I need to do more because I have all the support around me. Yeah, exactly that. And we wanted to remove any barriers Mm -hmm. to players who could potentially be national team players and represent England one day, Mm -hmm. but didn't have the the support or um, financial backing or family infrastructure, or they just didn't live in the right postcode. These kind of things we were trying to eliminate so that every girl had a chance to play for the national team if they were good enough. That's excellent. It's actually very excellent. I mean, and I guess that is why if you look at, I mean, if I look at Africa and so many other places where women footballers have to have a day job and then, you know, go and play football and still represent their country at national level. Whereas, I mean, in England, um, I'm not saying it just happened overnight, but they have football careers. Yeah. And it, until only up until quite recently, I think yeah. that that's shifted and, and moved. And I think female players now still feel the need to have a backup plan. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them will study and 
have something behind them so that if ever their career is ended early or yeah. when they retire, they have something to go to. Yeah. Because obviously the the um, the money in the game is nowhere near what yeah. it is for no, the, it's not. <laughs> the male counterpart. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. Look, I mean, you have a few game changers, uh, you know, like a Lauren James, who mm-hmm. then went out there and was able to, you know, secure. I think she's she's one of the highest paid okay. at the moment, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in the women's league. And and it's great. And I mean, you see a lot of those changes and transitions. But do you think we'd get to a stage where there will be real equal pay, not oh, but where they travel at the same, you know, they all travel business class or they all uh, stay in the same hotel kind of thing, mm-hmm. but the real equal pay. Yeah, I think it's, we're moving towards it, but yeah, it still seems like a long way off. Um, yeah, I think if some clubs are starting to implement this equal pay Yeah, and it, they almost act as advocates of the game or mm-hmm. game changers, yeah. the trailblazers, yeah. which is fantastic. But then we have to look at sustainability and yes. we don't want it to just be a token gesture. Yeah. Whilst we also don't want to lose sight of what the female game is yes. because the female game and the men's game are almost two completely different things. And you need to be able to find the balance because a lot of the times, I mean, you know, federations and stuff will say, oh, but the male teams have more sponsors, but why? Mm-hmm. W- what is going wrong somewhere? Yeah, and how do we give the female yeah. game that platform? How do we give the female game the very same platform? I mean, I think it was the 2019 World Cup where the US um, ladies team, the jersey was the most sold, um, the top. Okay. Yeah. And um, also, I mean, was it the UEFA Champions League final, the women, where it was like, Full, stadium full. Yeah, you, we're seeing that across yeah. the world now, aren't yes. we? Yes. The engagement and the following is huge. It's, yeah. So it has shifted again in the last what, three, four years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, drastic change, um, which is great. And you see the following that female games, it's very family orientated. You see yes. men, women, children of all ages, Yeah, uh, which is nice. The, the environment and the setting is nice. It's great to be a part of. No, no, no. Look, it definitely is. I'm going to take you back to the previous World Cup, the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. And um, what were your thoughts in the World Cup? I think there were nice surprises. There was good football. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of grit. Uh, It was good to watch. Yeah, (laughs) no, it was. Um, I had strong hopes for England being more successful, but we are... We're on the world stage. Yeah. Like they are competing now with US and mm-hmm. um, the other nations like Japan. Um, for me, that was another level of showcase. So we'd gone yes. from being in the European Championships. I remember being at Wembley at the time and then to see it somewhere else in the world. So huge. Yeah. It's such a following. Um, we're just going in the right direction year after year. That's that was that that's excellent, you know. I mean, I think I think we all have high hopes for our teams, mm. <laughs> but the Giants are still the Giants, you know. Um, but it doesn't mean that they can't be a new Giant tomorrow. Of course, yeah, of course. it doesn't mean that. And it's great that all teams are now elevating because yes. it means the level of competition, the level of exposure, yeah, it just increases. But it always goes back to that competition and exposure. Um, whether it's at grassroots level, whether it's at senior level, competition and exposure is key to uplifting the game. Mm-hmm. It has to be out there, doesn't it? It yeah. has to be visible. Yeah, it, it definitely has to. Um, your move to the UAE, how was that for you? Um, exciting, <laughs> <laughs> very different and yeah. quite challenging at mm-hmm. times. Um, I I came with a view that I'd done what I needed to do in England. Um, it sounds silly, really. When I when I was younger, I set three little goals. Mm-hmm. The first one was to work for the Football Association. So straight out of university was to do that. Yeah, the second, which was achieved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the se- I worked with like five to 11-year-olds in yeah. a school setting, um, implementing like England DNA. Second was to go to work every day with the three lions on my chest, which then I evolved into my role with with Mm -hmm. England and that became the case 
And then thirdly was to sing the national anthem as part of my job. Yeah. So these three goals I'd, I've, I just evolved and achieved. Mm -hmm. So then I came to a point in, uh, I had my daughter in 2020. So I became a mother, Whoa. which then shifted my priorities. Yeah, I was always polar focused on being national team coach, mm -hmm. being the best coach I could be. And then as you'll know, when you have children, it just, you realize that there's a lot more to the world than yeah. what you first thought. I mean, you still have your goals and your dreams and stuff, which is important, yeah. but a lot of other things shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so coming to Dubai was a decision that I made to, um, as a mother, I wanted to be able to still to be on the grass coaching, but mm -hmm. also to be present at home. Mm -hmm. So coming here allowed me to do that in the first instance. Yeah. Um, and I had a lot that I wanted to come and bring to a different environment. that was mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more underdeveloped. Yeah. A few years behind. And I saw something at Alliance that there was there's a real spark there it's special yeah they had a good girl set up mm -hmm. and other clubs were starting to implement the same mm -hmm. but it needed a boost and it needed some direction and some structure mm -hmm. so um yeah 2022 october 2022 i came and we've we've built so we went from maybe having 60 70 girls mm -hmm. all mixed age and abilities to yeah. now having a full pathway from U9 right through to U18 mm -hmm. and we did have a senior women's team the challenges are huge because yeah. players have not been exposed to the same as what I had been used to in yes. Europe yes um, yeah. which then you have to almost strip back everything that you deliver or everything you do mm -hmm. and you're also dealing with different cultural dynamics yeah. Yeah. which can be challenging um, but if you're able to adapt you can really influence and affect change here because it's, I wouldn't say it's untouched anymore because a lot of the clubs are doing some really good stuff. Yeah. But there's still so much to do. No, definitely. There, there, there definitely is so much to do. But, you know, you t talking about the pipeline that, you know, mm -hmm. you develop for, for women's football and, um, you know, the coaching structure. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so I came and I had a look at mm -hmm. what is here, mm -hmm. or what do they have and what's missing, mm -hmm. what do they need. Mm -hmm. um, very early on, it was very clear that um, they need a lot of technical work. Yeah. Um, there was a big ethos around being together yeah. and being there for social reasons. Mm -hmm. So we had to use the strengths and build from there. Um, sometimes it meant that develop player development decisions would be put to the side to make sure that players were happy and comfortable in a setting where they wanted to come and be part of something. Yeah. So they had a sense of belonging first, mm -hmm. which then with a depth of players coming into the club, we were then able to shape what that looked like in terms of them, what was best for them mm. as players mm -hmm. and as individuals. Um, the One of the biggest things that we, we needed to do was bring in female role models. Yeah. So when That's I, very important. Mm, yeah. When I first came, um, we had uh, a girl called Nikki. She was the ad admin. Um, yeah. And she played national team for Philippines. So she was a role model, but she she was doing some like, operational stuff and administration yeah. tasks. We brought her in as a coach. We gave her an opportunity to use her knowledge and mm -hmm. get her on the grass and influence the girls. And then it's just almost... Um, sort of snowboard from there. We've yeah. been identifying talented female coaches to come in and it really helps with the girls having someone to relate to. Yes, yes. And then to learn from and to want to be around. Mm -hmm. and, and we now have a full female coach um, pathway. That's amazing. And I think if more clubs can, can go down that avenue and that route, that would really help, especially here in the UAE, because mm -hmm. it's often a question we get asked, do you have female coaches? Do you have mm -hmm. female staff? Yes. It's almost a, a requirement for them in order for them to break that barrier of their daughter coming to play football. No, that, that, that is important. I think there was, there was a time as well, um, I can't remember if it was FIFA or CAF, that it instilled that. But I know um, like in South Africa, I mean, football is one of the most played sport in the country, uh, men and women, you know. And um, one of the things that that had to take place was um, there had to be this huge drive to develop female coaches, you know, mm -hmm. and get them licensed. 
And it started with ex-players, you know, ex-national team players and stuff who then drove that. But I think university sports as well also played a huge role in like providing scholarships and, and bursaries for, for female footballers, you know. Yeah. And if you look at our national squad right now, most of the players are from university structures because then they offered that kind of structured football, not taking away from, you know, your community clubs and stuff like that, but also just looking at how do we advance the game? And and then it was also you needed to have, I mean, we understand that, yes, you started off with male coaches and stuff, and we cannot take away from the male coaches. I cannot stress that enough. We cannot take away from them and and the input into the development of women's football, but they need to they needed to be like a, a succession plan mm -hmm. on how do we get the females into the coaching structures. Um, you know, and then we had a rule to say you need to have at least one female on the bench, whether she was an assistant coach or your physio or whoever, you know. Do you see that happening here to kind of grow or is it already happening here? Um, I think it's very uh, individualized and specific club yeah. to club because yeah. the nature of football here, the landscape is heavily private academies. Yes, yes, so it is. they have to be invested in some way, shape or form into Definitely, yeah. um, programming that mm -hmm. way and operating that way and giving females space mm -hmm. in, in that game. Um I think there's definitely value in that. We yeah. offer we offer scholarships to players to mm -hmm. come in. Mm -hmm. um, we support our coaches with uh, any coaching qualifications if they come in. And we we actually had one of our coaches, Matty. Mm -hmm. She was part of our women's team. Mm -hmm. um, she's from Tanzania. She had CAF qualifications. Yeah. And she's gone from being a player in our senior women's team to then coming in as a part-time coach and now works full-time with us. So it's really important for us that we give females the opportunity to do that. Mm. But it would be great to see that across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's more we can do with linking in with um, the federation, yeah. uh, universities, like you say. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that landscape looks like, but there's definitely a lot to be done. Yeah. And I think now more and more clubs are showing an interest and yeah. in wanting to build and develop their girls' section. So we've had conversations around like coach, female mm -hmm. coach development yeah. um, groups or... Uh, like communities of practice, yeah. conferences. At the moment, there's nothing. So it's almost a blank canvas for us to yeah. start from and see how do we positively influence that. Yeah, how do you start that and positively influence and, and grow that? Because it can only yield positive results. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the girls are coming, more and more girls are playing, mm -hmm. but now we need to build the infrastructure around them and for yes. them. I think, look, uh, if you're looking at how women's football has evolved around the world, it's inevitable that you'd get to the point where every little girl wants to play football. Yeah, that's you know? the dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and 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 they should have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. you know? And it should be the norm. It shouldn't yes. be questioned. It should, it should be. just be okay. Yeah, like, you know, what? You want to play football here? There's a ball. Yeah, Go. Cool. Come, let's do some drills. <laughs> <laughs> Does your daughter play football? Well, well, she's still young, but she, yeah. yeah. So I'm conscious I don't want to like force her down yeah. the football route. As she associates me going to football and her going to football as her spending time with me at the moment, oh. which is nice. Yeah. But she's actually in a little football session after school. And uh, from what I've heard, she's just sitting at the side because there's no other girls. She's the only girl. Oh. And I asked her if your friend was there, if a uh, little friend, uh, Summer, would you play? And she said, yeah. So there again is the example of there's, it, we're not there yet in yeah. terms of that group is solely boys, male coaches. Yeah. Um, when she's old enough to come to Alliance, she'll be, I'm sure. she'll be there with yeah. us and she, I think she'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that must be so cute. <laughs> yeah. It is when she say, Mommy, I want to play football or Mommy, uh, come and play football with me. It's really nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's like, oh. This little me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mini me. Mini me. I'm not sure how long it will last. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's quite a dancer and oh. she's into like music and uh, gymnastics. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see, maybe. We'll see which direction she takes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's good. I mean, I think when, when you were growing up, 
uh, okay, yes, gymnastics was there because gymnastics was associated with girls, um, you know, but you still got the opportunity to play football. Yeah. You know, it was there. It might not have been at that level, but it was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it whilst it was there, it happened. So it must have, something was there if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was challenging. Maybe it was difficult, but it happened. And yeah. then now I think it's everywhere. Yeah. And it's becoming more and more the norm. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> so... You know, over and above football, where to from here? Um, so, yeah, Dubai ex broadens your horizons. Oh, it horizons. definitely does. Oh, it definitely it does. It opens your eyes to a yeah. whole new world. Yeah. Um, I think for me, my passion is um, empowering females, whether it's in football, whether it's in sport, um, making sure we have representation, yeah. making sure that we we're not owned by the stereotypes that are attached to it and that we can move beyond that mm -hmm. so that women can really stamp their mark, mm -hmm. um, conquer whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. And I'm not sure what that looks like, yeah. but uh, that's where I'm, I'm almost driven to, to make sure that our girls have a platform, yeah. our coaches have a platform, mm -hmm. and females anywhere in the world, whether it's in football, sport, business, any walk of life can really shine in whatever it is that they do. Yeah. I think that's very important um, to have that or if you have the opportunity to create that platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like um, I always say, you know, it, it's always about the next generation that I, I want to leave this world better than I came into it, but also at the same time, not just leaving it in like, oh, I did this and I did that, but what did I leave behind exactly for that. the next generation to then continue and make it better? Yeah, exactly that. And I think I, since I've moved into this role where I'm off the pitch, mm -hmm. you see things a little bit more differently. Yeah. And I do think, I look at my little girl and I think, what does it look like for her now yes. in 10, 20 years' time? Yeah. Yeah, there's um, lots of work to be done. No, definitely. But speaking of the transition from coach to administrator, <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't easy for you, was it? No. <laughs> I still find myself struggling every yeah. time I go to the pitch. I almost feel like I made myself redundant. Um, but in a good way, it just yeah. you have to shine a light on different areas yes. and see things differently. And then you almost become a, you take up a mentoring role. Mm. Um, and yeah, I'm still coming to terms with it, getting to grips with it. It's been maybe a few months, but I can see now where we can we can shape things and yeah. add value in different ways. But it's growth as well. Yeah, personal growth. Massive. Yeah, it's massively definitely growth as and well. And club growth because yeah. the role didn't exist before. Wow. So in the game, like a particular alliance, that it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So we've evolved and I feel fortunate to be given that opportunity to step into that leadership position. No, that's amazing. But I think, you know, when you've had your mindset or your heart set on something for so long and – you achieve it, it's always great to get an opportunity to expand from there because I don't know about you, but, I mean, do you sometimes, like, when you were coaching and stuff, like, okay, I've achieved, well, almost everything that I wanted to achieve in coaching, what next from here? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I felt like that yeah. probably within the last year or so, yeah. like, what next? Mm. Um, and I think now I've entered, like, the, it's almost like a business world of, operating how the club runs yes how we have impact how we grow mm -hmm. and how can we use that platform to then yeah support the game yeah and 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 that's amazing it's it, it's it's great because you still involved in what you love but at a different level mm -hmm. at a level and i know as a coach yes as a coach you 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 sit there and you're like okay um, but I am changing the world. I am changing somebody's life. I'm, I am. But imagine that on not just on a coaching level, but on a whole different scale where you can change the landscape. Yeah, on, on a global level. Yeah. Yeah. I think you almost have a responsibility too. When you've gone through that process from yeah. a young child playing to then becoming a coach and you're doing things for the first time, yeah. I look back at my role models, females in the game, 
and they've almost been trailblazers throughout my journey and mm. there's so many of them and then you come to a point where actually you have to find a way to give back on a larger scale yeah and that's good <laughs> would you still consider if the opportunity came up national coach um do you know i don't think i would i think i've my my mindset or my shift mm -hmm. has gone beyond it now mm -hmm. um I was very polar focused when I was younger on yeah. having that yeah. um, and working towards that. But now I feel like um, there's a bigger impact to be had. Yeah. And the sacrifice being national coach is, is huge. You're away is, a lot yeah. of the time. Um, it can be quite relentless. Yeah. But no, I think in terms of coaching, I will do it and use it as a tool and a vehicle to mm -hmm. move things forwards. But I think that part of my career is done. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You're happy with, with everything there. So yeah. it's time yeah. to. And I'd never, this feels weird because I don't think I've said that. So I've just sat wow. here and said that. And <laughs> okay, you just realized that for yourself. <laughs> yeah. That's great though. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. Like I love uh, the opportunity when I'm at the pitch yes. to go in and every once in a while work with the U9s or whoever it is. And that's nice. And you'll never lose that you I will always have that love for the game and want to dip my toe in every now and again but I think in terms of a role I think um yeah I'm going in different directions yeah as I say growth you grow you you know you realize there's there's more out there for me to achieve yeah exactly that yeah um the FIFA the new FIFA regulations and stuff that have come out with regards to you know, women that have had babies, moms and, and, you know, and them being reintegrated and, you know, and trying to kind of look after the, their well-being, which is great. Um, I love that 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 is happening for, for women uh, footballers. I mean, that's how you see an Alex Morgan could have a baby and come back and still achieve it. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> at the, yeah, at, at, at her highest level. Um how long do you think it would take to actually kind of filter down to the rest of, because yes, I mean, it, it's great that the discussions were had and a working group has put together and all this has come into play to instill that within different federations and for them to instill that at club level. Yeah, I think we're at the very start of yeah. that journey. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, for females in the game. Yes. Um, I always look back at when I chose to become a mother I almost then chose not to be a coach anymore yeah to an extent or not to uh, to sort of take a different route mm. to where I thought I was going yeah um and it seems crazy that you almost have to make that decision yeah and it was maybe subconscious but you always have to factor that into at what point of my career am I going to do this if I do this now it then affects this 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 yes whereas you would hope that once that is filtered down that is not the case anymore yeah whether it's for coaches whether it's for players um but i think we're at the very beginning yeah and i think it's great that now it's out there and it's a conversation that people are having yeah. and fronting and looking at how we can mm -hmm. instill that yeah because i mean it was almost unheard of you know once a woman has a baby that's it it's over mm -hmm. like you know Move yeah, on to even saying that it sounds crazy. It does, hey? It really does. Or then it was like, I need to decide whether I want to continue playing or I want to start a family. Yeah. And why can't you do both? Exactly. You yeah. know? Um, I think Serena was also, Serena Williams was also quite instrumental in being a game changer in that, you know? And go out there, play at, what was she, two months pregnant or wow, something? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, then like, okay, I need to go and have this baby now and yeah. I'll be back. <laughs> and she was it's, back. And I mean, you see that now. It's inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. And then it makes it okay. And it gives yeah. people, they, 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 it can be done. Yeah. It can yeah. be done. As long as the support is there. And, um, yeah. We just need more and more of that wraparound support for females. Yeah. So that they can continue. Yeah. We need a lot more of those conversations, but also a lot more of it filtering down and being... Mm not just rubber stamped but implemented yeah yeah and policies procedures yes. strategy yeah it has to it really has to 
Jess. <laughs> it's been great chatting. <laughs> it really has been. Thank you so much for Thank you, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule to humor me. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you ever so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.